Welcome again, everybody, to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm Phil, along with John and Logan today. This is episode number 94, wherein we explain our absence for last week and talk about the pluses and minuses of sourcing lumber. Hope you enjoy today's show. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. So one of my goals for this podcast is to do it weekly, which some weeklies are easier than others. And last week was one of the more difficult ones because of life issues going on mm -hmm. in that I had a uh, diarrhea, right? I had <laughs> a, a T O U S that had to come out of my front yard, a tree of unusual size. Yep. And it, we were, Logan was there helping and it was three solid days of chainsawing and carrying logs and sawdust and chips and whatever. <sighs> yes, it was. And my hands are still a little sore from that. <laughs> like the rest of me has recovered, but for some reason my hands are still a little, a little tight. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. I still got my golfers. I don't know if it's golfers or tennis elbow, whatever, whichever one I have inside yeah. of my elbows. Mm -hmm. Still sore, man. And taking anti-inflammatories every night. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And, and while you guys were doing that, I was moving houses. Yeah. So I think we timed it out that I got my house moved faster than you got the tree. Moved, <laughs> so. Right. Although oh, to be so fair was... that my tree is about the size of your house. So, right. Yeah. So it's pretty equal. Yeah. So we'll, we'll give ourselves an excused absence <laughs> for last week. And we'll, we'll make it up on the back end. Right. Yeah. So Phil, was there anything? During that tree removal, because it was it was a buddy of mine that did the removal for you, uh -huh. um, and I've obviously in milling and stuff. I've I've seen them and helped them a handful of times do removals. Never start to finish like that, so that was kind of fun. Uh, but I've been there throughout the kind of entirety of the process. Uh, was there anything that was surprising to you? Uh, several things were surprising to me. Okay. The first one was out without being kind of squ for squeamish folk is like seeing where your meat comes from, so to speak. Yep. That part's not surprising to me, but what was interesting was the various equipment that was used to pull down the tree mm -hmm. and how to the untrained eye, it seems like none of that stuff should be as effective as it is. <laughs> Yeah. So this, the tree that I had in my front yard was, uh, what did Sean said? It was like 76 inches at the base across. Yeah. yeah. And it went up like that, like six feet, six and a half feet, and then branched out into five limbs or divisions or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. And each one of those was the size of a large tree. Yeah, he cut, Sean cut those with his um, uh, 661 chainsaw that has a 36 inch bar, which the dogs take about four inches of that. So each one of those limbs was in the 30 inch range. Right. Yeah. So, so good sized trees connected to a massive one. And in the process of it, because, you know, like on one side is the house, one side is the driveway, the other side was, uh, power lines and clearly you don't want to put large, heavy wood shaped objects on either of those at a high velocity. So they were cutting down sections and lowering them with ropes on the surface. Doesn't seem that complicated, but you had this gizmo that was wrapped around the base of the tree. What did you call it? A Porter wrap? It's called a Porta wrap. Porta wrap. I didn't know if it was Porter, like Porter house steak or Porta. Anyway. It's this thick rope that wraps around the tree. And you're thinking like, this is going to support multiple hundred pounds of logs up in the air. 
Like, so you need a solid knot to tie this to the tree. Nope. It just wraps <laughs> around the tree. Well, you saw how I wrapped it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's called a timberline hitch. And it's a legitimate, just 100% friction knot. Right. So there's there no, no there's no rabbit going around the tree and down into the hole and <laughs> loops and all that kind of stuff. It's just rope wrapped around a tree, wrapped around the rope. And it's like, yep. And a little yep. bit of trust and faith. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then attached to this is this metal gizmo that has a couple of like a steel loop and a pin running through it. And it's shiny metal about the size of an NFL football. And again, the rope, and that's what the rope that goes up and connects to the branch that's going to get lowered goes through. So this guy was cutting off logs that were eight feet long. Some of them were, mm -hmm. you know, and a good 12 to 14 inches around. And, you know, they, they weigh way more than Logan does. And Logan just has rope wrapped around this shiny metal rod. <laughs> And he's just holding onto it with like one hand, like, okay, I'll lower it down. And then just starts walking it in a little bit and it just slowly drops down. Yeah. And it's like friction should not work like that. It's amazing how much friction will hold. Like, cause what, well, yeah, that was the Porter wrap thing, right? Yeah. 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 That Timberline hitch that I, so I, those guys, those guys being my buddies that were working on the tree with you, they like to tie the Porter wrap off. Yeah. I ain't got time for all those knots. Like, I don't remember them. I don't do it enough to remember them. So I always remember the Timberline because it's just like you, you throw the Porter wrap around. You throw the sling. It's called a whoopee sling. So you throw the whoopee sling around the tree. And basically it goes around and it just you just coil it around the line that's already going around the tree. And the, yeah. that friction will hold 30,000 pounds. Like, right. It's ridiculous. Um but yeah, I mean, like some of those, and it's it's funny because depending on the tree, will really depend on how many wraps you need on the porter wrap. Because the the goal is in a perfect world, the weight of whatever's attached to the end of the rope going down to the porter wrap. You the more wraps you have around the porter wrap, the more friction. So the more weight it will hold without you having to hold it. Right. But in a perfect world, one hand, you can just hold it. And if you walk in, the branch lowers. If you don't move, you don't feel any extra weight. So that's kind of the, the goal. Yeah. But it's amazing how different different trees are. Because this is a silver maple. I mean, it was yeah. a big silver maple. So it's fairly lightweight. I mean, <laughs> didn't seem like it on Thursday morning after one day of doing it. But yeah, um, yeah it's... It's just phenomenal. It's it's cool. And it's yeah. like looking at the tree, it's like it, it's the old, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. I mean, it's right. just one piece of tree at a time. Yeah. So a lot of my friends and family obviously know that I'm a woodworker. And when they heard that the tree was coming down all the way, because what precipitated this is not the fact that I just wanted to kill off a large tree in our front yard is one of those five major limbs fell off following a storm like two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, just in the middle of the night came crashing down. There was a power line or a power pole like 50 feet away, snapped that right off at the base, you know, neighborhood lost power, all that kind of stuff. So it became a hazard tree at that point because it was unbalanced and we discovered that there was a humongous crack running right down the middle of the tree, pra practically splitting it. So we took it down. And anyway, I had friends and family say, you know, like, since this was a humongous tree, like, hey, you're going to keep some of the wood, right? And use it for projects, which is where I want to go for like the main point of the discussion today is why that was not possible for this particular tree. Yeah. Uh, so I, I will mean, say, I'm surprised you didn't at least keep like a bowl blank out of it. I thought about it, but yeah. I, I mean, I don't have, I feel like the problem with that is I would have had to have worked on that almost instantly before it yeah. starts drying out and cracking. Yeah, that's fair. So, yeah. Yeah. So the problem with a tree like that, like, 
straight up, we're just talking straight lumber. Like, I'm not talking slabs. Because, I mean, yeah, that base was huge. That base would have made some really nice, like, big slab tabletops, like Matt Cremona style, right? But it was so big. Like, there's no way I'm cutting that. I don't I don't even know. I don't know what Matt's capacity on his mill is. I don't even know if he could mill that. Like, the thing was huge, right? Yeah. And so the trunk aside... All these limbs coming off that thing, there was a couple issues with them. One, there was a lot of hollows in that tree. Right. Um, there was a lot of areas. <laughs> I got splattered with tree sludge at one point when we dropped a limb, and there was a knot hole that was hollow, and it was full yeah. of, like, it looked like mud, yeah. but it's not mud. Right. We were calling it maple butter because it had yeah. kind of the color and consistency of apple butter or pumpkin was... butter. <laughs> Hmm. It splattered just, everywhere. <laughs> just don't get it in your mouth or eyes. Right. Yeah. That's, how you, well, that's how you get pink eyes. Well, and, <laughs> and Jason had, uh, he was starting to cut a limb and it wasn't that limb, but he started to cut another limb and it just sprayed all over him, like out of the chainsaw bar. Uh, so, so you have that problem where a lot of these limbs started to grow, put off another limb and that limb died and broke off. And now all of a sudden that there's, an entrance point for critters and infection and water. And, and so yeah. you have the, the inherent, like there's issues where there's, there's hollows. The other issue we have with a tree like that, and it's people that don't woodwork. So non woodworkers don't understand how wood after it's dry can move, how there can be tension within a board. So, right. If you've ever cut into a board and had it either start to split, spread apart or pinch tight together, um, somehow there's tension in that board. Now, that could be from curing from the drying process, or it could be from how the tree grew. And that's kind of what I'm getting at, is whenever you put a, a, a limb or a tree, let's just say a tree in general. If you put a tree on an incline, so it's on a side hill, and it's starting to grow and it's hanging out away from the hill and it starts to fight itself to bring itself back standing straight up. Um, one side of that tree, the fibers in one half of that tree are going to be more compressed than the other half of that tree. So you have this weird tension built up. Um, it's like, it's like bundling together a stretched out slinky and a slinky that's not stretched out and making them one unit. Like you have that, those two tensions are fighting each other. Same thing with limbs. So as limbs are growing, they're hanging out in space, right? The bottom half of that limb is under compression. The top half is under tension. So you have these, and, and as soon as you cut it and release it, that tension doesn't go away. That tension has been grown into that limb for 50, 60, 70 years. Right. Um, so I get a lot of, again, when I say non-old workers don't get this, I get tree guys that still bring me limbs. And I'm like, I don't want limbs. Like, I will <laughs> no, I don't want them. Like, even even growing at a slight angle, you'll get some tension. And you can see that when you cut a board off of a cant, that board will kind of start peeling up as you're cutting. Or it will start shifting left or right. So all yeah. of a sudden, you'll look back at your board and it's curved a half inch away from you. Uh, which is, it's like, how how is that doing that? Um, but I guess that's the inherent thing why a tree like that, big, huge, beautiful silver maple, a, a BBS, a big, beautiful silver maple, <laughs> BBT, BBT, big, SM. beautiful tree. Yes. Okay. BB, a big, beautiful tree. So a big, beautiful <laughs> tree like that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make good lumber. Right. Um, I mean, that's... <sighs> There is usable wood in it if you were turning. Yes. And you or wanted carving. like bowl blanks or yep. carving. Yes. Uh, you cut out a several burls. I did. Yeah. I cut off yeah, a bunch of little tiny little burls that I don't know if will be anything or not. Yeah. Like, <sighs> yes. But I mean, in terms of stop. furniture scale project boards, as big as that tree was, there was almost none of that there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a couple... That if if you said, hey, I want to save something, there is one particular, that last stem that got dropped mm -hmm. that almost grew straight up. Oh, yeah. That would be the one because right. it grew pretty much straight up. Um, other than that, it's just 
there's a point where you just you, you don't want to fight it down the road. So it's like I don't want to say you cut your losses because there's no losses there. Right. I mean, besides the tree has to come yeah. down, but it's just it's not worth the battle because yeah. you're going to be fighting it the entire time. It's gonna it's gonna bind. It's gonna pinch. It's gonna move. It's gonna bow. It's gonna cup. Um, it just doesn't make good lumber. There's there's a reason that sawmills will not buy limbs. Right. But like you right. said, it doesn't mean there is not use there if you wanted to. Yeah. You know, you know carving. The, some of the smaller branches, you know, if I were really into it, would have made nice spoons or ladles or something like yeah. that if I wanted to do that kind of thing. So I don't want to say that it was a giant tree that was, quote unquote, a waste of lumber. I mean, it was like six years of firewood. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so there's that. Uh, obviously, you know, branches and the small twigs and stuff like that, that all gets shredded and yep. whatever. But it, it's just was kind of an interesting point of discussion for an education for my family, who is not as interested in woodworking as I am to talk about, you know, why this isn't the, the right wood to use. Like even on, even if I were to have saved some of it for small boxes, you know, and you cut it down into smaller sizes there's not as much movement and stress within the wood, but there still is. And that can still, as you know, even if you were to think a small box, there's still going to be issues with it wanting to twist or to cup or whatever that yep. person would have to have to deal with. So, yeah. and that, that I guess kind of made me think of other ways of finding wood and what are the costs for it? Because the, the thing is, is that obviously building projects, no matter what you're doing for woodworking, one of your major costs is the material itself. So if you can find low cost material, that's a plus, but that doesn't mean that that fi a financial cost isn't the only cost that goes into working with wood. Right. Yeah. Because time is also a big cost. So you're spending a lot of time messing and fighting with wood that doesn't want to do what you want it to do. That could be another. Yeah. yeah. You story. know, cause a lot of times you'll see, and I remember when I first got into woodworking and was working at Woodsmith here, you know, you'd see people where it was like, you know, one of your, some of your first tools should be a jointer and a planer because then you can really save money on wood by getting rough lumber. Well, you know, we've used, and I just finished a project for video edition that used basswood that you had sawn, Logan, and, you know, you brought the whole flitch in and, you know, probably half of those boards weren't usable yeah, just because of, you know, defects in the tree that you don't know until you cut there. So when you're working with, you know, like this 20 inch wide by 12 foot long two inch thick plank of basswood seems like a lot of wood, but when you start cutting around all the defects and things, there's not as much there as you think. Yeah. Well, that's why in the, in the drying world, uh, in sawmilling world, there is a saying that like, basically what you get off the saw is about 65 to 80% what you're going to get finished lumber because you're going to lose that much during the drying process. And it doesn't really matter how, good and how controlled your drying process is you're still going to lose stuff um and something that off the mill i've i i don't know how many times i've seen this happen where it's like oh god i pull a board off i'm like that is a freaking gorgeous board you mark it and you're like i'm gonna that one's going in my personal stash like that's the the whitmer reserve stash right there <laughs> <laughs> and then like i'm unstacking the log a year later to sell pieces to people and we're looking for that special piece they want. And I get to the Whitmer reserve and I'm like, Oh, there's like three knots in it that have popped out. You know, it's like, they're there. They look tight. They look like they don't look like they're going to go anywhere. But when that board dries down, all of a sudden those are holes. You yeah. Know? So yeah. So anyway, that so it's like butchering where you're, yes. you're taking the whole hog and then, the bones and the yep, exactly. fat and all that stuff. And you get down to the usable meat and yeah. it's not nearly what it was yeah. to start with. Well, and it, that's kind of interesting because so this weekend I cut for a friend of mine um, and he was very adamant. I, 
he was very evident he wanted to pay for this wood because I've given him a lot. But um, we picked out, and I, I didn't know, he wanted bowl blanks is what he wanted. He wanted walnut bowl blanks, 12 by 12 by 5 to 6 inch bowl blanks. And I said, well, come out, we'll just pick a tree out of the log, or we'll pick a log out of the log pile. We'll cut it into bowl blanks for you on the sawmill. Not that big a deal. Now, I kind of struggled with how to price them because obviously I I don't want to be the same price as I'm not commercial in yard, so I'm not going to charge that. This is kind of my side hustle, my hobby. I like to do it. Yeah. And being a friend, I don't want to charge him retail price on it. Yeah. So it's like I was looking and I found some bowl blanks on Etsy or eBay for you know a twelve by twelve by three inch for sixty dollars. Like, well, these are thicker, so. They're double the thickness, so should it be double the price? Should it be a hundred dollars a piece? Um, and I'm like, that's he wanted ten of them. I'm like, that's a thousand dollars for that walnut log. That seems like a lot to me. Um, knowing that if I cut that into boards, that it is going to end up yielding you know x number of board feet. But then when I start thinking about it like that, it's like, oh, if I if I cut that log into boards, sell it or dry it. And then turn around and sell it, I could actually make significantly more money than just cutting it and giving it to him for a hundred dollars a bowl blank. Right. So what I what I kind of settled on was the whole we measured the log and the log measured out at two hundred and twenty board feet. And I said, Well, look here, my, my green price, my wet price for walnut is three dollars a board foot. It's like let's just call it six hundred bucks for the log. You know, it's a little bit under three dollars a board foot green, and I'll do all the sawing on it. And, you know, we cal- what what we did is we ended up calculating it out after we were done, and we actually ended up with about 190 board feet, which is a little less because you got to account for saw waste. You got to account for those um, right. scab pieces of bark, the slab cuts off the outside. So, yeah, there's it's very much like butchering, John. It's like there's there's all that stuff you got to trim off to get to the good stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but that's I mean, in another way that applies to almost every other source of lumber, you know, like oh, yeah. when you, when you buy it from a lumber retailer or the home center, all of that's been done for you. So that's why, you know, those prices are baked in to that particular board. Yeah. So you're not necessarily paying for that board. You're paying for all the work that gets that board. Yeah. You know, or if you're trying to rescue firewood, you know, you see, nice pieces that you could use or something, you know, you got to go through the processing of that and there's probably less in there than what you think. Or, you know, another thing that's somewhat popular or was for a while was reusing pallets Mm -hmm. or other found lumber, you know, like, yeah, it's really low cost material, but out of a pallet, how much, how much wood are you really getting out of it? Yeah. Well, and it's funny because I, so I used to get pallets in from, um, it would be China, China, Asia somewhere um, when we bought rings for our ring binders we made. And occasionally I'd get like really cool pallets. Like, I don't know what the heck this is, but it is so, it's like three times as heavy as that white oak pallet that's sitting there. So I, I, a couple times I did saw off boards off that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I had one of my paper reps come in and say, Hey, you probably don't want to be woodworking with that. I said, well, why is that? And Joe said, well, almost every pallet that comes, that gets manufactured in the U S and in China and stuff gets sprayed with like a powder pesticide. And I'm like, Oh, lovely. Like, let me just go blow my nose real quick because yeah, it's all over <laughs> yeah and pallets are are stamped and marked with i mean um to indicate that aren't they some i believe so yeah pallets. yeah some yeah. of them are i don't know there's some sort of code that you can probably google and yeah, yeah. there's a stamp on a pallet that people want to use to kind of tell you what's been done to it and if you should be using it or not. Yeah. Or, and who knows what's so. been stacked on that pallet previously and spilled right. on there. Oh yeah. Completely. Yeah. You know, or what it's been setting or, in yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, so. not, I'm not saying that it's not a good way to get some wood. Right. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there are definitely some health considerations to take into account when doing that. Yeah. And you should right. just be a little clear eyed as to what to expect from it. Yeah. Right. 
And that's why I only use railroad ties for all my woodworking. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, because once you get through the creosote, it's all good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's all yeah. good. Yeah. All, it's all cream. Yeah. Yep. Which is funny. I've heard I've heard of guys. And actually, I was talking to a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was at my house um, buying some parts off my sawmill for his sawmill. Um, and he uh, he said, what did Dave said he did? He was cutting a lot of white oak. He's re- he's restoring a um, Civil War era farmhouse in northern Iowa where he lives. He, he lives at the house. Um, but he also said uh, that he has a bunch of his son worked for the for like Mid American or something, and they got. He's like, I have so many power poles sitting there ready to cut, and he said they're all country power poles, so they're not like in town where you get like all the nailed posters on them. Mm-hmm. And he said they are the nicest cedar that you have ever seen. Really? And I'm like, it's like, hey, buddy, All next right. time you come down to buy parts, why don't you uh, yeah. bring me a gooseneck trailer full? But, hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, You know what I have heard, and I don't know how viable this is, and I don't know if there's if this is true everywhere, but I've heard a lot of guys say that they get free drops from either sawmills, so sawmills that cut boards to common sizes, and they will just give those away. So right. you might get you might get two foot three foot sections of random species, or get them dirt cheap, uh, or cabinet shops. A lot of times, love drops. Um, my father in law worked for a a millwork uh, here in Central Iowa, and yeah, like everything that came in, if they were running you know fifty thousand feet of crown molding, they cut everything to sixteen foot, and. It, you know, it might be a 20 footer that I cut to 16 foot, but there would be a four foot board that would be left that would just go in the scrap pile. Yeah. So, and it's, it's kind of like the epitome and what I try to be in my shop with like, Hey, it ain't part of the project. It's going away. Right. <laughs> Which is funny. Cause it's the same way here in our shop where we're very particular, yeah. you know, on our projects because they're, we're trying to make magazine quality projects so we have a lot of usable cutoffs that kind of just pile up because we're constantly building furniture and like anytime i'll you know i'll bring my dad through the shop or you know somebody that doesn't work here through and it's like you guys are just throwing that away like there's a lot of usable stuff in here so it's and it it just piles up so eventually we do throw it away because there's always we're always making more right you know scraps so i've always thought like oh do we need to like bundle this all up on a pallet and sell it send it outside you know, sell, sell it, it or yeah. like yeah or say hey somebody come get this yeah or put it out for free or something sometime yeah because it is i mean for most people it's usable stuff yeah they want to depending on what you're doing yeah and, i don't i mean right. i've built several projects out of just leftover materials from work here i know some of the yeah. smaller pieces get cut up and chris uses them for his outdoor furnace for mm-hmm. keeping his house warm through the winter so there's that. Um, I yeah. was also thinking as we were talking here, John, about the uh, trestle table that you designed. Yeah. You know, that we deliberately used reclaimed lumber from uh, a farm building in Iowa. Yeah, it was. I think it was a corn crib up by Ogden from the 1800s is what they said it came from. Yeah. And we got those in and we left a rustic surface on the top of the table, but I mean, there was still, there was still effort in transforming that into project parts too, mm-hmm. you know, no, even though, even though we got X beams of this size and whatever, a hundred percent of that did not go towards the project. Right. And let's be clear. Those were not cheap materials either. No. I mean, anytime yeah. you're talking reclaimed, yeah. It if depends on how some, you're sourcing it. Yes. If somebody sells right. something as reclaimed, a lot of times there's a, a charge for that. Yeah. Right. Um, now, if you go do it, that's a different story. Yeah. But Which I was surprised how well, I mean, they, uh, this was their business is to reclaim lumber and, and resell it. And they go through and they pulled every single nail, removed every piece of metal. And it was pretty clear. And, it, and some of it we did end up, like resawing some stuff and milling it down. And I was figuring board, board feet and it, it seemed expensive for reclaimed lumber. But then when I started figuring uh, board feet for what, once the roughness was removed, it was straight grain Douglas fir. And what we paid for, 
pay for it like out at the Woodsmith store. It was pretty cheap. I think once we figured out what this was, it was probably three to four dollars a board foot. Yeah. Okay. If you wanted to, if you wanted to look you know, at it that way, yeah. yeah. If yeah, to yeah. to get straight grain, old growth Douglas yeah. fir. I mean, it was very tight grained, and so yeah. I mean, it was pretty good stuff. So yeah, and to be clear, you know, I'm not gonna. I'm a pretty thrifty woodworker, so I'm not gonna discourage people from using one particular source or another, you know, mm -hmm. try and downplay one or another. It's just the idea that low cost is only one leg of the mm -hmm. table of putting together this project, you know, that while it might be inexpensive, there's probably a lot more time or hassle or investment in converting that into project pieces than there would be buying it straight out as boards. Yeah. I, my only experience really that has, well, I've had a lot of experience, if you guys can believe it or not, that have bit me in the butt. But the one that I can think of without my head was my, um, my workbench. I, I built it out of a, a bowling alley, a maple bowling alley mm -hmm. <clears throat> thinking, Oh, this is like dirt cheap. For board. If, I mean, if you were putting it in board foot terms, you know, I bought a, it was like three foot wide by 10 foot long, uh, two inches or maybe three inches thick. Like this is, it was like under a dollar a board foot. That was until I realized that every one of those laminations was held together with like six inch twist cut nails. And I was trying to pull them out. Oh my gosh. Like my wife looked at me about halfway through the project. She's like, you should have just bought all that. It's like, yep, I should have. You're right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, funny to say kind of the same, talking about wood floors, um, when I was redoing my kitchen in our old house, uh, there was wood floors on the in the living room that kind of connected to this kitchen that if I went to like Home Depot and bought oak wood floors, it's like all clear oak and it would not have matched what was put there in the 60s where it was a lot of, you know, different colors and not really uniform looking so I went and bought, uh, I think it was called utility grade. Yep. Um, cause it, it just, you know, was less uniform, but it was cheap. But then as you start going through the packs, it's like, oh, there's, this one's like half bark and you throw that away and <laughs> you end up throwing away about 25% of yeah. it, even though you're, you're trying to get a lower grade look to match the other thing. It's like, you still end up throwing a lot away. So it, I mean, it's not as cheap as you think. Yeah. So. But, but I, and knowing knowing me, I did wood floors underneath, all the way underneath all the cabinets. So it is. Tell me, you at, least at use, the cabinets. Use like, your junk yeah. parts under the cabinets. No, I didn't <laughs> use the junk parts. I still use good stuff. So yeah, no, I I will the top, but I will say I think woodworker or wood turners in general are pretty good at being thrifty because I've there's been a lot of um, things I have turned out of other things. Sure. Um, one of which I did for video edition was that uh, little ebony gavel that I turned into a mm. little brass headed mallet. It's like, I know how much ebony costs per board foot. So buying ebony turning blanks are going to cost me, you know, 25, 30 bucks. But this little ebony gavel it cost me $3. Uh, right. Same way you get a lot of those. They must have been popular back in like the 70s or 80s. Those like desert ironwood bird statues right those are freaking all over and you could find them for dirt cheap and it's like man if i went and bought a turning like if i took that owl and turned it into a turning blank that's like a 90 dollar turning blank because it's huge yeah so I, I i have no problem turning something on the lathe and defacing it <laughs> no issue with this at all. It's repurposing. Yes, not repurposing. Facing. Yeah. yeah. Upcycling. Yeah. I think they're calling it. Yeah. yeah. So for any of the listeners out there, I'd like to hear from you what your biggest, best lumber score is in terms of either reusing something or reclaiming or find some kind of found wood, low cost wood that you put to really good use. So if you want to put that in on the comments on our YouTube channel, or you can email that to us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com. I'd love to hear that. We can share some of those on a future podcast as well. 
All right. You guys working on anything? I know John is still moving partly. Yeah. Just trying to get my garage and shop back together so I can get back in business and start doing more projects. Yeah. More home projects. Mm -hmm. But for a totally different house this time. Yeah. Start all over. So do you need a one wall workshop? I'm thinking that I do. Yes. Because I was kind of thinking about that. And it's like, you know what would work in here? A one wall workshop. workshop. Yep. So start over and because it's like, you know, in a lot of garages, they have that little bit of uh, foundation that yeah. sticks up yeah. that if you have cabinets or shelves, you got to either notch around or deal with that. It's like, you know, if you just did it all like a, a wall hung bench and, a, yeah. um, you know, some hang, hung cabinets rather than, you know, on the floor. Yeah. Get some up off the. And the other thing is I've noticed is that my garage floor slopes. I mean, it's pretty noticeable slope away from the house and then driveway as well. So I think just my workbench up against the wall probably drops about a half inch wow. over 30 inches. Yeah. So if it's all wall hung, you get away from, yeah. you know, that. And that, which also gave me the thought with this slope on the floor as I was um, mounting my drill press back on its cart and it being very heavy. If I have carts in there and they decide to start rolling, they could be down at the bottom of the driveway real quick. <laughs> okay. Which would be scary with a top heavy right, you drill know, press on there. Drill press. Yeah. And at the bottom of my driveway is the neighborhood and across the drive or across our alley is the neighborhood transformer and utility boxes. Okay. So I was like, Okay, this so, could get so you need you need a really threshold that you need you yeah. need that speed right. bump. yeah a little bumper yep so those are all considerations as I'm thinking about what you know how the garage shop is going to transform over the next year. See, so. I was I was implying a red one wall workshop from oh, the third no. floor. I want to start from scratch. Oh, oh. Yeah. dang it! That would be a good but, score for uh, reclaimed wood, John. That would be a good mm-hmm. score. Yeah. Yeah, just take that and then mm-hmm. convert it into yeah, mm-hmm. just cut yeah. six inches a off smaller wall mount it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just wall mount everything. <laughs> yeah, isn't that one wall mounted, or is that on a, or is that on a? Base? I think that one's on the floor. Oh, okay. I think is the one. No, I'm thinking of a different one. Never mind. Yeah, we've done a wall mounted. Yeah. Oh, you have a. I have the oak uh, wall. Logan. Yeah, you I have, have a wall mounted one. I have that oak like craftsman style one. Yeah, which is more like a, it seemed like a bar office it's, utility it, type yeah, it make it's, a really really awesome like craft center right for somebody yeah. like yeah but, yeah so i don't know we've done wall mounted workbenches in the past and different stuff that i like to frankenstein projects uh-huh. so yeah. we'll see what that's fair and come up with because i think we do have a one wall workshop on the matrix coming up here mm-hmm. the next six months designed so. for the doyle household right right we can film it Custom. we can shoot the photos there yep so something to look forward to. Okay. I'm working on a couple of personal projects. So I have just two Christmas presents left to finish up, which makes me feel pretty good for this year. Mm-hmm. And um, have – you did a uh, video, Logan, on using your bandsaw to cut large pieces down into mm-hmm. basically like turning your bandsaw into a bandsaw mill. So I have some – still wet cherry blanks that I want to use for making a few spoons just to do that. Um, so I've been working on that. What else? Just a couple little storage and organizer projects. Those are always good. Mm-hmm. Yep. You got anything, Logan? I am finishing up the humidor for our next issue of pop wood. You guys ever have a project that, like, you're, like, 75% there. It's just not where you want it to be. That would be my mortising machine. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of in the same spot with this humidor. Like, in my head, it worked really well. Right. And it still works well. I just, there's many things after building one that I would change on a second one. Yeah. So, there may be a version two down the road there you go um have not decided yet um the the whole scorching thing worked out well however i think there's a reason that that's not used a ton on furniture because it is inducing a lot of stress on the 
box case, so everything has, it was all perfectly flat, everything fit together nicely, and then over the week, stuff started to go and twist a little bit, so now I'm kind of fighting that a little, um, so I'm kind of re-flattening stuff, re-burning stuff. Um, there will be a version two. I am happy with this one, but I'm not where it's not where I want it to be. Yeah. Where I know it could be. So at some point I'll do another one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think that wraps it up for another episode of the shop notes podcast. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, I want to hear about it. You can send it to us on our YouTube channel where you can watch the antics of our episodes, or you can send an email woodsmith at woodsmith.com. Please let other woodworkers know. Leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts to help get the Shop Notes podcast uh, on the screens and on the radar of other woodworkers like you. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build from furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs, and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.